are a nation in decline. We are a failing nation. Hi, everybody. Welcome back we to the podcast. We are a nation and other forms of stream, Twitch stream, excuse me. It's not the podcast tonight, Twitch stream. groceries to feed our beautiful families. This is, I don't know, the most insane video I've ever seen in my life. I thought I would open the stream with this. We will institute the Thank you, Kay Hill, for linking this in the Discord. Mothers will never again be forced to watch their children overdosing. This is, uh, I guess, Mad Max thematized to the 2024 election. Colleen, good to see you. Fernie, Ryan, Dagger Hardgrabber, old heads in the chat. Good to see everybody. Happy Monday. Where are we? What are we doing here? Let's uh, dial down this sound for a second here. So tonight we're going to highlight some recent works from Do Not Research. We're going to check in with friend of the stream, Brad Abrams. We're going to check in with Anna Savina, Anya Savina, excuse me, who published her piece today, an interview with Eric Davis, author of Technosis, which we're going to read in the DNR reading group coming up. And uh, in the meantime, I don't know, there's just some absolute nonsense that I have not entirely watched through. So hopefully it's okay for TOS and whatever else. Um, I enjoy it. I enjoy it. This is beautiful work. Uh, this is the kind of work that we should be uplifting and celebrating. Extremely relevant artistic work. <laughs> um, okay, so where, where are we? What else is going on for the program? We're going to look into something called louche today. Louche is a topic that I learned about from dear friend of the stream, JC Denton, who you will frequently see in chat, co-host of the Pneumatic Materials podcast. We're going to watch a citizen journalist, uh, amateur conspiracy theorist on YouTube <laughs> made a very low quality video explaining what louche is, why the Demiurge designed Earth, Far Journeys, Bob Monroe, uh, Something so valuable that off-world engineers, a.k.a. the Demiurge, sorry, and then the rest of it is just there's an ellipsis and the title continues. It's a whole paragraph of a title. So we're going to do that, and then we'll end our stream with a documentary from Al Jazeera about evangelical Christians and their influence on foreign policy. What is Biden doing in this video now? This is terrifying. Yes, hat today. <laughs> Good to see you, Georgia, in the chat. Yes, I'm wearing my Forever Magazine hat in the stream uh, because I'm very far behind and I'm overdue for a haircut. <laughs> and I've been traveling, just got back into town. So, uh, yeah, we're catching up on a few things tonight. And Josh is more or less prepared. This is a YouTube, Twitch type of stream. It's not going out on the main feed or anything. So we're uh, a little bit more casual. We can have some fun. We can be... Uh, a little bit more risky with our content tonight. God, this is terrifying. Oh my God, what is happening? You know, it's kind of like Skibidi Toilet, actually. It's kind of like Skibidi Toilet. Like, I have no idea what's going on and there's just insane characters all over the place. There's a fish inside of a skull warrior who's vomiting crabs? Are they going to do the crab dance? Yeah, it feels a little skibidi. Okay, all right, let me pull up uh, our other content here. I'm losing all my tabs. Pausing, <laughs> pausing skibidi toilet 2024, and then we're going to dive right into this piece from Brad Abrams. Maybe let's put on a little bit of music in the background. Spooky music for tonight. So Brad told this story on what was the QAnon Anonymous podcast. Uh, this is a text version of the same story that um, featuring Joseph Cantrell, very disturbed character. We've got a true, true crime story for tonight. And I'm going to go through this in as much detail as I can. Some of it will have to be excluded from YouTube and Twitch and whatever. So excuse me if I don't share my screen for the entirety of this piece. Let's pull it up on the smaller window. Maybe we'll do that. Make this visible to everybody. There we go. Okay, so we begin with this security camera footage, which is frightening enough on its own. If you are not familiar with Brad's work, we have watched a few of his videos on the stream before. I encourage you to follow him on Instagram. I've got his, I'll drop the URL actually in the chat. Instagram and Twitter. We have links to the socials up here. You can also find it in the piece on Do Not Research. That's where I'm pulling the links from. But let's dive right into the story. 
Neural Deceleration. It begins with a quote from Joseph Cantrell, I came here to add commas and stab people, and I'm all out of commas. In my practice as a documentarian, I humanize my subjects regardless of how dark, disagreeable, or fantastical their views. Telling their life story or traumas while showing how they live now as a person gives context and a new understanding of their beliefs. In the lives with sadder outcomes, like my film about David Dees, these pieces can function as cautionary tales, pinpointing when and where things start to spiral. Writing this particular story, though, with an exhaustive amount of context at my disposal, a 1,000-page online life journal, just left me feeling confused and hopeless. <laughs> You'll probably have the same experience reading it. Excuse me while I fuss around with the zoom here so I can read it on the stream. It started at the sprawling Microsoft campus in Redmond, Washington. I thought this was initially uh, a reputational liability, like a, a, a leak from Microsoft that they were concealing violence among their employees on their uh, official campus, but it gets much, much darker than that. It was 5.30 p.m. on February the 23rd of 2023, and a Microsoft employee, we'll pseudonymously call him David, was clocking out for the day. He stepped out into dark, into the dark and drizzly evening, looking forward to unwinding with his wife for the rest of the night. In a stroke of bad luck, he missed the walk signal at the corner of 156th Ave Northeast and Northeast 28th Street, just south of the Microsoft building num er, number 27. As he waited for the light to change, he heard a man shouting in the distance. As the shouting grew closer, it sounded more like unhinged ranting and raving. He tried to ignore it and mind his own business, but out of the corner of his eye, he saw the stranger walking briskly towards him. Before David could turn to face him, he felt a rapid succession of searing pains in his neck, head, and torso. He was being stabbed. He fell backwards, hard, onto the pavement. The stranger continued to stab and stab David, stab David, instinctive as David instinctively tried to shield himself with his feet and hands. A witness said David's screams sounded like a dying animal. A driver who was stopped at the intersection said he saw the stranger, quote, stabbing the shit out of him. He and another driver jumped out of their vehicles and yelled at the stranger to stop. This was enough to scare him off, sending him running down the street. The whole incident lasted just 10 seconds. First responders arrived quickly. David had been stabbed 12 times, and there was blood everywhere. Surprisingly, he was still conscious and was able to describe his attacker to the police before being rushed to the hospital. He said it was a white male, 5'9", in his late, in his mid to late 20s, dressed in a dark hoodie and black pants. The man was a total stranger. Around this moment, his wife received a notification on her phone. It was an automated alert sent from David's Apple Watch, letting her know he had just taken a hard fall. She tried to call, but there was no answer. To add to the oddness, it said his coordinates were in Sa Seattle, which was the location of the hospital they drove him to. He was admitted in critical condition, with a fractured skull, brain bleed, nerve damage in his hands, and other in injuries. God. And here we have the mugshot. It wasn't hard for the police to find the attacker. A literal trail of blood led him, led them to his nearby apartment, where he'd barricaded himself in. After breaking down the door, they found him trying to trash the evidence, namely a knife and gloves covered in blood. He was identified as 26-year-old Joseph Cantrell, and he was also a Microsoft employee. He was charged with one count of attempted second-degree murder and one count of first-degree assault. Sup World. Next heading. Powerful ghost, Mr. Dude. Thank you for joining us on this extremely dark, <laughs> terrifying evening. Surprisingly, the story was just a blip in the headlines, not even making national news. This may be this may partly be on account of Microsoft scrubbing all references of Cantrell from Bing and DuckDuckGo news. Who? <laughs> sorry, to, I know this is not the appropriate context, but like, who uses Bing and DuckDuckGo? <laughs> like, uh, they scrubbed it from Bing and DuckDuckGo news at the time, and still to this day. Oh, Billy's in the stream. Okay, let's make sure we don't find any furniture that he can ID. <laughs> Maki Gumo, it's good to see you. I guess an average employee stabbing a fellow coworker wasn't a good look for the company, no doubt. 
I was about to find out other reasons they may have wanted to keep this out of the news. After seeing a few of the local news stories with frustratingly brief coverage, the documentarian in me, this is from Brad Abrahams if you're just joining us, the documentarian in me wanted to know who Joseph Cantrell really was and what his motive and what his motives for such a gruesome surprise attack were. It didn't take me long to find his website, an element none of the news outlets mentioned, and things were about to get a lot stranger. The now offline site opened with this bio, and we have here a screenshot from God, the the uh, design on this site is uh, is really something. This is this level of graphic design. That's how you tell someone's mentally ill. Joseph Cantrell. This is his official website. Screenshot from the now uh, offline page. Home projects about. We have about me here. Photoshop cutout of him with a little bit of a halo on black. Quote from the website. Sup world. I'm Joseph Richard Cantrell. A currently calculated 27.799573571 year old straight white male programmer with a passion for flashlighting the electron torch of mutual prosperity? What? I am merely an extraordinary man and nothing more. My evolved cells, their DNA, and everything else in my body have their grassroots in my family. To get here, my god damn it. To get here, my grandmother immigrated from Germany to the USA during Adolf Hitler's bolstering of Nazi Germany in the 1930s. After marrying my grandfather, she gave birth to my late mother, Patricia Ann Cantrell. I only remember seeing my alleged father less than 10 times total, but my mother was always there for me. Quite a bio for the, I mean, <laughs> this, is, this is kind of what you imagine for the uh, average programmer who works at Microsoft, <laughs> right? Um, not what I would have led with on my LinkedIn, for example. It goes on to reveal he was prescribed Adderall for ADHD at age five, hopefully that and a bunch more, and had been on it for most of his life since. He grew up with his mother in Columbus, Ohio, before attending Georgia Tech, where he graduated with a BSc in Comp Science, Computer Science. From here, the bio shifts into a hyper-detailed quantifying of his life with tidbits like... I've spent 84 days of my life playing Modern Warfare 2 and 50 days playing Borderlands 2 on Xbox 360. At age 11, I once wrote 90,000 words of a novel called Kresler's Quest, similar to Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Blue Rescue Team. JREG if the art career didn't work out. <laughs> this is, guys, this is going to get so dark. You're, uh, <laughs> this is the absolute worst possible outcome for Dreg. This is, uh, yeah, it couldn't it couldn't get worse than this, actually. That was the first video game that made me cry. Which one? The Pokemon Mystery Dungeon? Or Modern Warfare? Or probably Borderlands, if I had to take a guess. I once ate, he continues, I once ate a luxury dessert of a baker's dozen original glazed Krispy Kreme donuts in one sitting. He, he finishes here, I hate Star Wars, high school musical, college football, and the show Friends. After a long and highly technical musing on the nature of space-time and the universe, he ends with a tract about ADHD, as well as hinting at his mother's substance abuse during pregnancy. Oh boy. Cantrell writes, My various neurotransmitter release rates decelerate over time due to a prenatal genetic alteration by alcohol and tobacco. But in my neural disturbances, I've danced and conversed with processions of rainbow ghost women rainbow ghost women to keep me company through the occasional der derivative misty night from age 5 to 26 i called this attention deficit hyperactive hyperactive disorder adhd now i've grown to call this part of myself neural deceleration disorder ndd so self-diagnosed with his own made-up disease that he artistically visualizes through uh, what appears to be a Photoshop filter and then I guess the liquify the liquify tool on Photoshop and you set the, the brush to twirl where it like clockwise twirls the image. So we've got uh, Emu, good to see you in chat. Really, um, really high quality stuff here. It's a swirl. I think it's twirl. I think it's called twirl is the official name for the brush. 
Elsewhere on his site, he exhaustively lists his favorite video games, including Borderlands 2, Bioshock Infinite, and Kirby's Adventure. TV shows, a lot of anime, who, who would have guessed? <laughs> a uh, schizophrenic murdering psychopath is into anime. I, I've never been more shocked in my life. Uh, he places Death Note at the top of his anime list, South Park, Futurama, Family Guy, King of the Hill, and Scooby-Doo. Favorite movies, this guy should have a Facebook profile. Why is he putting all of this on his own site? Um, favorite movies, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, Friday the 13th 6, Halloween 4, Nightmare on Elm Street 4, Garfield A Tale of Two Kitties, and Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island. Big sequel fan. That's, uh... So one of these is not like the other. His favorite novels include Harry Potter, The Stranger by Camus, and Huxley's Brave New World. Here we go. Okay, I'm going to have to uh, not share my screen for this part. Besides being an avid gamer, Joseph was a homebrew game designer. On the games section of his site, nestled among some innocuous shooters and platformers, were a few more questionable titles that cracked open the window to his psyche. I'll start with the most brazenly edgy first. It's titled Anne Frank Simulator. He writes on the site, this paro parodic, parodic game, this parodic, how do you say, parodic, parody? This parody game entails Anne Frank, oh God, I don't wanna, I just skip over that part. In a single night, I created this to reach the limits of American free speech. Although controversial, I reiterate this game was made in good fun, akin to the likes, akin to the likes of Robot Chicken. Holy shit! Apparently, as Anne, you'd have to resist being shoved into. God damn it! The link to this game was broken, but not so for the others. The next, next game is called Profit Launcher. Cantrell writes, Aim to offend, yet test devotion to the pillars of humanity's most sacred in this endless, speedy 2D shooter parody. As the final prophet of this world, the annex, annex the souls of the endless legion of old prophets and use them to enhance your own power. Begin with the first prophet, Jesus, the cross man sent to destroy your Old Testament to faith and die for your sins. Oh my God. You, oh fuck, why did, I, why did I choose to read this? You play as either a Columbine-styled shooter or large-breasted woman shooting up Jizid Mohammed, who is really just Osama bin Laden with a suicide bomb, the Star of David, Buddha, Hitler, and what I can only describe as a pagan marijuana wizard. A pagan marijuana wizard? Can I play the video for this? Alright, fuck it. Okay. I'll show I'll show you the this is a video of the game. It looks terrible. This looks awful. Buddha, where is this? Oh, that's the <laughs> that's the marijuana wizard. Wait, what? How does that work? <laughs> how does that even? And then you kill Trump too. Scripture, scripture, sacrilegious. Oh my God, Jesus. Worse. <laughs> okay. Um, next is an even more crude looking and simplistic game called Untrumpable, where you play as Donald Trump do dodging fake news and collecting truth. You control Trump's face flying around the screen, frantically dodging the CNN logo, a missile with Kim Jong-un's face, the Twitter bird, and a USPS van branded with Biden and Xi's face on it, all while collecting falling diamonds and money. Oh my god. Okay, and we've got a clip from this game. This looks even worse somehow. Tap left and right to dodge fake news. I don't even get 
what you're supposed to do in this game. <laughs> God, okay. He died? Not, um, not a great game designer, to be honest. Not a great game designer. The last one is most, is more interesting. It's a first-person 3D exploration game called For My Aspect, which he describes as a loose metaphor for his ADHD. The rest of the description reads, quote, awaken atop a lodge on fluorescent mountain during an excursion to Alaska. I'll share my screen again here. Excursion to Alaska. Play through the eyes of Sipane Skipane Matella, Italian name, a rich novice novelist searching to regain his sense of surroundings. Skipone brought a PC, a cat, a flashlight, and some rations to travel light. Experience beautiful Alaskan vistas and slay your personal demons. All right, let's take a look at this playthrough here. For my aspect. Kind of looks like mist. There's the lamp. Oh, it's kind of scary. What? It's in an ocean of blood. God, okay, wow. Um, <laughs> browsing the site of this attempted murderer felt eerie and haunting, like I shouldn't be there. Yes, it feels like we shouldn't be here. He covered his life in such candid and vulnerable minutia, though it wasn't yet enough to connect the dots towards murderous intent or to call his life a cautionary tale. But I was soon to discover that all of this was just a trickle of info about Joseph. The flood was yet to come. I and others found a hidden link to a text file on his site posted to, posted to the day before the crime. You wanted to ID that scream? What? Holy oh god, my god. We are, are you serious? Are you serious? The Wilhelm scream is a stock sound effect that has been used in many films and TV series beginning in 1951 from, from the film Distant Drums. The scream is usually used when someone else is shot, falls from a great height, or is thrown from an explosion. The sound is named after Private Wilhelm, a character in The Charge of a Feather, a 1953 western in which the character gets shot in the thigh with an arrow. Unbelievable. Okay. People know this? Ah! I'm going to go back and listen to it just to confirm. Oh, it was, it was later. Sorry. It was earlier. Ah! That's it. Okay. That is... I'm very ah! impressed. I'm very impressed. I, how, I've never heard of that. How am I supposed to know about stock screams from 1951? Is this like common? <laughs> is this common knowledge for people? I thought we were IDing furniture. I don't know, man. This is uh, not, not what I expected, but I'm very impressed. Like learning grapefruit isn't purple. What? Grape <laughs> God damn it. Okay. Um, let's get to the text file of this. Yeah, I'm not, a, I'm not a film major. I don't know about stock uh, stock sounds for film. I gotta say, I haven't yet, I haven't seen anyone else in chat ID it, so yeah, deal with it. Well, you got a point there. Secret hyphen journal hyphen wall hyphen trump card v2 josephcantrell.txt. <laughs> Jesus. The file is a 234,000 word or 100 page life journal. The first paragraph reads, this was originally a document detailing my drug use and my thoughts on or during their, the, their effects like the dream journal my mom brought me when I was a kid. However, it is now my overall life journal and literary practice. It should be freely and posthumously published to help humanity or whatever. Yeah, or whatever, bro. This is a big, it's definitely not helping humanity, so I'm going to go with possibly whatever. I'm sure it will help someone in the future, given the challenges I've faced with abnormal genetics of decelerating neuron firing rates. The first 20 pages detail every single substance he's experimented with starting at 19 years old. 
Some are the familiar suspects like amphetamines, LSD, mushrooms, cocaine, MDMA, meth, and heroin. But it was the amount of obscure research chemicals he lists that was truly impressive. This is just a partial sampling. Damn, he might be... He might be... He might have made himself insane with doing too many research chemicals. 251 MBOME, 2CT2, 2CE. These are all just, it's like non, it's like reading the back of a serial number, basically. This is, he's like, yeah, all the drugs I did, just turn over your modem and then read the Wi Fi code in the back. Those are the drugs that I'm doing. All of these substances, amphetamine sulfate, aka Adderall, uh, that was his true love, glowingly described by him as. This is the gold standard and my ticket to life with neural deceleration disorder. Rainbow women and even a white light and full body orgasm at high doses. Dog was smoking on that Ethereum. Yeah, he's just, he's like, <laughs> he's doing hash rates basically. Yeah, he's getting high on hashes. Jesus. Okay, so this guy is mentally, he's got a degenerative disorder. He's made himself insane through uh, research chemical drug use. He's also just seemingly crazy, probably undiagnosed schizophrenic as well. And his life is falling apart and he's an attempted murderer. He disliked meth the most. Actually, this is, this is surprising. He likes Adderall, but not meth. This drug, he writes, this drug feels like a dirty poison Joshua flowing through Rellerite, one's veins, like alcohol's bodily state, feelings. The roads here all lead to the dominion of Adolf Hitler his wife, and his Nazi regime of no remorse. This guy will not, oh my God. He liked to use LSD and DMT to enhance his weightlifting, claiming they made him able to lift twice as much weight. What, I didn't get what his reasoning was for stabbing his workmate. Well, I think maybe that's what we're trying to discover by looking at his work and his life journal. Uh, maybe we'll get some clarity in that uh, towards the end of it. A similar li similarly, Similarly lists his favorite snacks. Reese's Pieces, peanut butter cups, sour Skittles, Krispy Kreme, hot dogs, restaurants, Golden Corral, Wingnuts, McDonald's, IHOP. This guy has terrible taste. He also lists his workouts and supplements and the 10 different tricks he taught his dog, Breezy, to do. Make it rain. We've got another piece of art from his site. Rain like uh, a king would rain. The rule over whatever. Is this from a game or just from his website? After the tediously thorough list, the Life Journal chapter begins with this entry. February 1995. My mom, Patricia Cantrell, and alleged dad, Bonnell, love have sex in a motel room. Oh, Bonnell Love is the name of his uh, father, uh, alleged father, I guess. We know for sure. Have sex in a motel room conceiving me. It follows with the stark admission that his mom drank and smoked heavily while pregnant with him, and that his father was estranged from them even before Joseph's birth. Several times he calls her a racist, with pride, wow. Uh, he writes of her alcoholism, alcoholism, which led her license, led to her license getting suspended after causing an accident while drunk driving. Without a car, how does this guy get hired by anyone, much less uh, a, a big tech company? With, uh, well, maybe I shouldn't be surprised, actually. <laughs> That's exactly who they're looking for. Alleged dad, Mr. Bunnell. Yes, Stephen Bunnell. Bunnell is his first name, actually. Bunnell, first name, last name, love. Without a car, she lost her job at the Piggly Wiggly and wouldn't find another job for 10 years. As a result, they'd go for months at a time without electricity at home. When she finally got a new job, the lights came back on. He told Joseph, she told Joseph that this was his birthday present that year. This poverty also meant she couldn't afford proper treatment when she was diagnosed with cancer. She died at 54. The more recent the journal... So at least from that, we can definitely, definitely safely assume that this guy was never given mental health treatment, psychiatric treatment, never medicated. You just have an undiagnosed crazy person with a drug problem and a degenerative disorder from smoking and drinking while pregnant. What a terribly sad story. The more recent the journal entries become, the more off-kilter they get. He talks about getting a kick out of dr <sighs> God damn it. He talk talks about getting a kick out of dressing up as Hitler for Halloween. 
He details how he jerks off for hours at a time. There are about 100 references to his STDs. And as his amphetamine use becomes more extreme, paranoid delusions start to take hold in his mind. He's a gooner. Yeah, yeah. July 2022. These past two years, it's felt like an enemy has sat outside my door the entire time I've been in these two motels. I want to learn guitar, but my thoughts instantly turn to the swarm of enemies I picture on the other side of both walls and standing outside my door. I do believe I'm becoming more paranoid. He thinks that movies are making direct references to his life. Even movies made before he was born, like Scarface. He was terrified of Jews, black, brown people, and especially Indian immigrants. He journals about team meetings at Microsoft where he exclaimed disparaging things about his Indian colleagues. Yet still, Microsoft kept him employed, allegedly even after seeing the game section on his website? What? Microsoft kept him employed even after seeing the game section on his website with that insane shit that I showed earlier. Unbelievable. He was a believer of replacement theory, of course, we shouldn't be surprised, and woven into these fears were an insistence that members of these groups were gang-stalking him. For example, he writes, quote, The black and Latino gangs intend to screw me out of my money with deceitful corporate practices like tampered vending machines and IT departments dedicated to programmatically and periodically severing my internet connection. They also want, no, oh, this guy is really unwell. This guy is just, he's very sick. They also want to screw you out of my, screw you out of my time, very strangely worded, by pointing you in the wrong direction in stores. They also, they're pointing you in the wrong direction in stores. Yeah, it's an aisle four and it's actually an aisle five. They also want to goad me into being sued, jailed, or killed because my pain is only a pawn for their amusement. He became convinced that these black and Latino gangs wanted to give him and other people with ADHD diseases, other people with ADHD, diseases like STDs and COVID-19, as well as hitting them with cars and telling him mean things in passing like, you're crazy, you're a crazy person, or you're a violent person. All of those three things actually true. He is a crazy person, definitely a crazy person, and he's also an attempted murderer. So, uh... Sounds like a bunch of people are just telling him true things. Yeah, poor guy. I would feel less bad for him if he wasn't obsessed with Nazis and also tried to kill someone, you know. There were hundreds and hundreds of pages to go, but I couldn't subject myself to too much more of this, Brad writes. I decided to jump to the end, to the days leading up to the attack, February 15th, 2023. Cantrell writes, My cousin called me an asshole. Sounds right. Analogous to amphetamine hole which is characteristic of my birth disorder and the neuro and visual holes in response to amphetamine treatment. I'm sure the U.S. military government pumped him full of methamphetamines and told him to keep quiet. My family is compromised. I can't count on them to help me. They're basically Nazis. The Nazis had families who helped them. Hitler had a wife. This guy needs to decide who the bad guys are in his story. How the fuck was this guy functioning at his job, Makigumo said. Yeah, seriously. This is like at the level that, you know, you interact with this person for one minute, you know they are insane. I've never been more justifiably paranoid in my life. After everything I've written here to describe here describing my story, where do I go to stop people from hurting me? And finally, on the afternoon of the attack, after extreme sleep, de sleep deprivation from stimulants, here's this last statement. I love Patricia Cantrell. My mother was the only person in the whole world on whom I could truly rely. I love my dog Breezy, my girlfriends Essie and Taylor. I pray to live in peace. I wish I had impregnated Essie or Taylor, gotten my act together, settled down in a house, and lived in peace making art. However, my history sucks. Even though I don't believe in God, I hope and pray everyone does better for each other. Yeah, I gotta say that I kind of suspect that the girlfriends are made up. Like, are these... And also, as I was reading Essay, 
it's capital E, capital S, lowercase i. I don't necessarily know who this refers to. So I guess, um, well, this kind of explains it as we had asked earlier. Yeah, maybe an AI girlfriend, actually. Yeah, exactly. An hour later, he left his apartment and stabbed a stranger to the brink of death. He is currently awaiting trial after pleading not guilty by reason of insanity. And here we have a picture of his dog. What is the dog's name? Breezy. Dog Breezy. Jesus, what a what an insane story. There are a lot of mentally ill people on the internet. A lot of mentally ill people on the internet. That is the kind of thing that is extremely surprising that either his employer or his friends or his coworkers didn't check in advance. You know what I mean? That's uh, a little bit surprising. Let me link his socials here for a moment. If you're not yet following Brad, I am linking his Twitter. Um, we've watched a bunch of his video work on the stream before. He really makes these uh, incredible short form videos and documentary series. Uh, show his website here as well. If you want to check some of this out. But recent post on Do Not Research, I think this was uh, one of the first pieces we published in the new issue. And now we're going to check in with Anya Savina, who recently spoke with Eric Davis, who is, uh, as I know him, the author of uh, Technosis, which I'm very much looking forward to reading in the DNR reading group. Uh, I've read passages, many passages from it uh, throughout the years, but I've never actually read the whole book, so very excited about that. And you recently sat down with him um, and interviewed about, uh, in their interview, they discussed a whole, a whole variety of things that should be very familiar to a lot of people in this group. Um, libertarianism, California ideology, longevity, uh, and so on. Maybe I'll keep the scary music on because I just, I kind of, I kind of enjoy it for this. So uh, Anya begins, let me show uh, first her social. So Anya has a Substack you can subscribe to. Instagram. Um, oh, I thought she was a private account. So we shared it today. You can actually see this is the, uh, the post that went out to Instagram. The full piece is uh, obviously on the Substack. You can't read um, the full length on the on the Instagram account. And then we have the, the Twitter as well. I'll link both of them in the chat as we go here. And he writes, a few weeks ago, I wrote about tech millionaire Brian Johnson, who claims that an AI algorithm is helping to significantly extend his life. I wanted to delve further into this topic and explore the link between AI and longevity. So I decided to interview Eric Davis. He is a scholar, journalist, and the author of High Weirdness, Drugs, Esoterica, and Visionary Experience in the 70s, and numerous other pieces on tech, spirituality, and mysticism. We discuss the connection between religion and longevity, the aesthetics of transhumanism and blood transfusions, and our bleak gerontocratic future. Gerontocratic future, very nice, yeah. You know, our reading group is two weeks from yesterday. Yes, very much, very much looking forward to this next one. Uh, Anya begins, do you think there is any connection between longevity as a trend and California ideology? Californian ideology. Do we keep... Why do we keep seeing this come up and when come up when we read about Silicon Valley elites in particular? I'll share here for a second the, uh, can I just see the, oh, I guess I'm not entirely logged in. I just want to go to the, the page. I'm not logged into anything here. Oh yeah, this is what I'm trying to share. This, the image from, um, what is the, is the Silicon Valley show with the blood boy? That's um, a very nice lead image for this one. Okay, so why do we see, why do we keep seeing longevity and Californian ideology commingled in uh, a lot of the uh, Silicon Valley rhetoric? Eric Davis responds, I think it has to do with the peculiar cultural and psycho-spiritual history of libertarianism in America. You can't understand Peter Thiel or Elon Musk's less conventional science without understanding how, at least in one major formulation, 
Libertarianism is not simply a desire to have minimal government and no regulations over capital. It's also a psycho-spiritual psycho -spiritual claim for freedom. Maki Guma says, I know we're moving on to a new article, but this grad guy, Brad guy is active on Instagram and knows about the article, and nobody in the Insta comments seems to be talking about the stabbing. Wait, what? <laughs> Maki Gumas. Um... He's active on Instagram, yes. He knows about the article because he wrote it. Um, I think, oh, I think you're confusing, sorry. The uh, attempted murderer is Joseph Cantrell. Brad Abrahams is the documentarian and the author who wrote the piece. It's not, <laughs> I wasn't linking the accounts of the, of the murderer, just to be totally clear. <laughs> That's really funny. Yeah, yeah. I'd be like, hey, guys, yeah, check out this uh, true crime piece. Um, shout out to the attempted murderer <laughs> plugging his Instagram and shit. That's pretty funny. <laughs> I mean, that's not funny. I shouldn't be laughing about it. It's <laughs> pretty good. Uh, Eric Davis continues. For example, Robert Anton Wilson, who is a very fringe countercultural figure, never made a lot of money, didn't care about capitalism, was a libertarian. He was a right-wing anarchist, meaning an anarchist that's not as interested in social formations, but more like a Max Stirner-style egoist. Hell yeah, now we're getting into all of it. He was also interested in longevity. If you believe in people's right to determine their fate, then inevitably death becomes an enemy. If you go back and you look at the history of longevity movements, you're going to find that there's this libertarian approach. And you're also going to see an interest in technology because it helps overcome these limits in our natural political, institutional, economic world. So millionaire's interest in longevity is not just about being raging egoists. It's also about politics and control. There's a great Bruce Sterling novel, Holy Fire, that elaborates on what happens when you have this installed gerontocracy. With recent advancements in AI, it's also much easier to imagine the concentration of capital will create will create tech overlords that will be able to actually populate the universe. And the personal version of that cosmic story is achieving immortality and getting off the planet. And it follows up to ask, what's interesting to me about Brian Johnson is that he was a member of the more, he was a member of the Mormon church. What is the relationship between religion and the scientific pursuit of longevity. Secularism offers a substitute and resistance to traditional religious viewpoints, but religious longing and imagination inevitably seep in. The most obvious example is singularity. It seems like a rational idea, but what you've actually produced is a secular analog for some kind of transcendental culmination of history. This is obviously a religious narrative, or at least originates as one. Once again, we're living in the shadow of an apocalypse apocalyptic movement that's just around the corner, not unlike the early Christians in Rome who are waiting for Jesus' second coming. That creates a whole subjectivity in relation to this upcoming moment. Those people don't see it as religious, but I do because it ends up serving a familiar function, even if the details are different. Transhuman Mormons are very interesting. Yeah, they have their whole, um, they have a, what is it called? The Mormon Center of Transhumanism? Like they have a headquarters, an institution out in Utah. Uh, they hosted Zoltan Isfan to do a few different lectures there. But yeah, transhumanism and Mormonism, very compatible, actually. Uh, Davis continues here. It's really interesting that Johnson has this background because Mormonism definitely has a science fictional flavor. From this point of view, he abandoned religion and went in this other direction. But in Mormonism, God has a body in the future and Mormons aren't ghostly and in some kind of heaven outside of the material world. For them, it's a material cosmos, and if you're a good Mormon and you do it right, you're like the patriarch of a planet in a body with your family. Right, okay, I remember the intro uh, sequence to Big Love, right, the, the Mormon uh, HBO show from like a, a decade ago, and it's like them on this little planet, like the uh, King Kai from Dragon Ball Z who had like a tiny little planet, and there's like a dozen people standing on it holding hands. It's not that hard for me to imagine how someone would leave the church and then continue with a kind of imagination and a certain kind of relationship to the body as a vehicle for the immortal spirit. 
We watched this clip. How long is this clip? This in is building this peer-to-peer like -peer internet, here. the paradox that we're up against is kind of that people won't want to participate until the quality is high. And the quality won't be high until... Um, and um, the quality won't be high until we have a lot of people opt into the network. So that presents a little bit of a, 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 a unique... Continue. Uh, uh, okay. It presents a, a, a bit of a problem What would that we kind of need to build. Uh, uh, Are you sure? Everything okay? I, I don't know. Is it? Oh, sorry. Guys. Bryce. Bryce. Guys. Uh, actually, we've met. Oh, hey, Donald. Uh, it's Jared now. So, Gavin, Bryce is... Very discreet. Keep going. This is great. Uh, is Bryce your assistant? No, of course not. He's my transfusion associate. Which is? Are you really not familiar with parabiosis? Can't say that I am. Well, the science is actually pretty fascinating. Regular transfusions of the blood of a younger, physically fit donor can significantly retard the aging process. And Bryce is a picture of health. Just look at him. He looks like a Nazi propaganda poster. <laughs> oh. What does it do to the aging process? That's unbelievable. Unbelievable, these people. As, conversation, <laughs> as conversations about blood transfusion and other practices related to longevity make many people very uncomfortable, why do you think the aesthetics of the movement fall into this uncanny valley where many things that prolongs one life feels almost repulsive. Uh, Eric Davis responds, uncanny is a good word for it. One of the things I admire about the libertarian attitude towards the human experience is its willingness to question and actively resist many of our conventional ideas about what it means to be human. If you are on the transhumanist train, you are explicitly embracing aspects of our potential that are not human or are uncomfortable from a human point of view. Therefore, there is a freakish quality to it. Many of us are convinced that it's natural to die or to get lines on your face. Plugging a computer chip into your brain is not natural. That's disgusting for many people, right? I, yes, I would agree. I, I don't want a, a, a chip in my brain. No, thank you. So the transhumanists are wondering, where's that edge and does it really exist? There's something about that that I really admire, but it leads to this kind of this weird kind of nerdy aesthetic that seems to lack all poetry. It's a quantitative way of thinking about human value. Whenever I think about the people who get like the chips in their hand or whatever, like the RFID chips, they can like open a lock or whatever. I think about the plugs on the phone. Like I have a very old phone, but like these things change so often. I don't want to implant any hardware in my body. And then like two years later have to get like surgery on my brain to get the new updated plug or something like that. It just sounds like a horrible proposal, to be honest. Uh, Davis continues, there's a way in which the whole technological mindset, the efficient self, the self-hacking, the biohacking, all of it is just a way of literalizing human experience and then taking it beyond the limits that most of us impose on it. There's also an aspect of an astro astronaut aesthetic where you're eating from little foil packs and everything around you is made of plastic and metal and there are no plants and you love that. Transhumanists often embrace this very cheap and easy aesthetic and they lack a certain kind of poetry that you might find in other anti-humanist or post-humanist models. Anya asks, what is the relationship between singularity and AI and how does that link to longevity? To which David Davis responds, the language of the future needs to change to make it feel new. Otherwise, it loses its power. The language of singularity emerged in science fiction and then became popularized, even becoming a mainstream signifier that can be mocked in popular media. It had a long life. And I think it has been replaced by AI for several reasons. AI is a more tangible thing that we can already see in our lives, making it easier to think about. It also shares many features with the singularity because, of course, the AI is what will wake up and become smarter than us. There is a feeling that all existing models and technologies are insufficient to address the historical significance of the current moment. That, I have to say, I totally, uh, I totally <laughs> uh, empathize or identify with this uh, sentence. All existing models and technologies are insufficient to address the historical significance of the current moment. Yeah, it feels like we're straddling, um, 
I don't know, a, a, a few different trend lines that are really defining that like the next few years is not going to look like the last few years, socially, politically, technologically, environmentally. He says it feels closer. It feels closer, which to some degree is more terrifying. It's like a singularity with teeth. And what does that do? It affects longevity, as you mentioned. There is a cultural connection among a uh, cultural connection among people drawn to these different concepts. I have no idea what Brian Johnson means by claiming that AI assists him in his longevity journey. That's part of the flavor of the aesthetics we were talking about before. The body becomes a kind of the body becomes a kind of meat robot, and we're going to make sure that that the meat robot lives as long as possible to go out into space. It's a radical reimagining of the physical body that paradoxically affirms the physical body. Rather than just saying, oh, who cares about it? We're just going to upload ourselves to the cloud. Most people don't really want to do that. I, th I mean, my, my own opinion, I'll share it in a second after I finish this paragraph. Let me just, there's one more, two sentences here. The body becomes this privileged point between the earth and what we're leaving and the post-human future that doesn't really require a body anymore. It's our little spaceship that we need to have because even people who want to live forever aren't really ready to live forever inside of code. But who knows? Yeah, it's that idea of living forever inside of code. Um, I'm thinking of the Johnny Depp movie. The um, What is the Singularity uh, Mind Uploading movie with Johnny Depp? Uh, the, na the name doesn't matter. Maybe somebody in the chat knows it. But uh, for all of these things where you create your like digital double and you upload your mind to the cloud or whatever transcendence yeah thank you that's exactly it it's i mean it's a fun it's a fun silly movie whatever um but that that idea of like your body dies your consciousness dies and then you like have your social media profile and your mind is uploaded and ai fills in the rest and we have this like digital duplicate of you i've always found that to be very unappealing because my actual consciousness and like perception of the world like you you die in the process. <laughs> like there's something that really resembles you that continues. Um, but it's not, it's not me. Like I'm not experiencing that I'm dead. And then there's like a copy pasted version of me in the cloud. Some people are really excited about that. I don't know. It seems terrible. Like I'm still dead. <laughs> you know, I would much, I would much prefer to like extend my natural lifespan and have a body or whatever. How do you know that's what, that's what, what actually is corporations own the AI doppelganger, isn't that the plot of a video game? It's probably the plot of many video games. Yeah, plot of a few movies. Let's watch this video here. Uh, this one this is, not is metformin. This is given typically to diabetics. It's been also taken off-label for longevity purposes. The people who I admired the most did things typically over a multi-decade time frame. People who in their time and place, they survey the landscape of things that they can do and they identify the thing that can barely be seen and say, I'm going to try to do that thing. Yeah, good. Here comes the scary pictures. I started Braintree when I was 27 years old. I bootstrapped the company for the first four years and you know, we were profitable every month. And then I raised money and we sold it for 800 million. And then I made 300 million of that. At the age of 34, I thought it's time to try to do something meaningful on that kind of multi-decade timescale. Yeah, My objective with Blueprint is to demonstrate aging escape velocity using the best science, trying to do all the appropriate interventions to neutralize my aging process. 1.8, so even better than last time. So I think my first one was 3.4. A few things have distinguished what I've done to date. As far as I know, I'm the only person that has publicly posted my data. So I'm not saying, here's my protocol, and believe me, I'm saying, here's my protocol, here's all my data, and here's what I'm experimenting with next, and here's where I've made mistakes, and here's where I'm trying to fix it. It's really a stacked process of maybe a hundred different things. I do, because you have to think about the, the body in its entirety. 118, is that right? Mm -hmm. How the heart ages is different than how the lungs age, and how the lungs age is different than how the brain ages. You have to really think about it from a holistic perspective. So it's the common things like diet and exercise, but it's also 
a much broader consideration. So I have a team of doctors that I work with, and we just go through this rigorous process of measurement, gold standard science, implementation, measurement, is produced near perfect health yeah, what was that food? for me. No matter how extreme I've had to be, no matter how eccentric people perceive me to be because I'm outside the norms, demonstrating that age can be arrested would change everything. Certainly made a lot of media appearances. Plea to. I don't know, when I see this guy, um, I just, I tend to think that like, this is such an incredibly complex uh, process. Like he's doing so much stuff. Um, like who, who would have time for this? Like it's obviously his job, he makes money doing it, but how is one person, <laughs> Billy says quote, God damn it. <laughs> I drink onion juice and sun my balls every day. Never touched a receipt since 1995. <laughs> Those are the, <laughs> that's my longevity program. Yeah, onion juice, sun your balls, don't touch receipts. That's all you need to do and you will stay young and natty forever. I just, I think about this Brian Johnson stuff and like who could possibly ever devote all the time to doing all of these activities like he wakes up his whole job is to like do exercise take supplements get all of these tests done um like how could you do anything else someone had mentioned like celebrities doing this kind of stuff i can't imagine anybody doing this program because it's just so involved you know it's like you can just be the experiment all day I'm 100%, I'm 150% sure it's all a cadre of doctors scamming him and working together to keep the racket going. Bro looks miserable. I have a lot more respect treating their body like a 2007 Honda Accord. It's sad to think he's doing all that stuff and gets the same result as 10 drops of methylene blue. <laughs> he does have $300 million. Yes, that's true. He looks so inhuman and reptilian. He does look a little, a little spooky, I gotta say. Anya, uh, continuing with this interview, she's asking uh, author Eric Davis, if we ever achieve this future where privileged people can live longer, what are some of the implications that you see? Davis responds, I don't know when it will become obvious, but the human race is composed of different lines that have fundamentally different capacities based on their access to technologies, genetic engineering, education, etc. We already have these layers that we all know about. It's uncomfortable because it's not written in stone, but it's also, but it's also true. The variety is largely based on class. Nice, based. Glad we got that in the glad we got that on the record. And over a long period of time, the separation isn't going is going to reach a point where it becomes more obvious. It's uh it's already <laughs> to me, it's already extremely obvious that uh the separation is entirely based on class. What's happening now is that to varying degrees we recognize this, and some people are thinking about it in terms of politics. If you're an overlord, why would you want to share power with people who aren't even getting the same opportunities that you and your children are getting? It's, it naturally leads to an anti-democratic position, which has been more and more obvious in Silicon Valley, the new right, and the dark enlightenment. The political implications of it are significant, but there's also a psychological question of who we are of who we really are. And the new developments in tech will make us confront this question very soon. We used to think, oh, AI is going to be making our political decisions for us, or it's going to be like the smartest scientists on the block. Nobody expected AI to directly impact our humanity in this way. Art, poetry, image making, music, writing, so on. All of this softer stuff, all the cultural stuff. Now these fundamental features of human psychology and human identity are simulated in a way that nobody expected. It's going to create reactionary formations, and it's going to create anti-reactionary movements. That's why we're seeing movements like QAnon and the fears of vaccines and of a transhumanist agenda. This is what billionaires do when they are fugly. <laughs> the only thing that makes sense about this dude is that he left his wife when she got diagnosed with cancer. Holy shit, dude. For real? For real. Wow. The conflict is already visible, and that isn't going away. Within a few generations, the sense that there is a human race that we all belong to is going to be more obscure. And so, in a way, longevity is a feature of that because that's one of the most obvious ways 
ways that this differenti differentiation will announce itself. And the ugliness of this aesthetic is a way of saying, I am no longer in the human world with your cute little politics. So, sorry, cute little poetics. I don't care about that anymore because I'm on this other train. We don't see a lot of it. We also don't see a lot of it because a lot of it is hidden. Peter Thiel is okay with being famous, and Brian Johnson wants to be famous, but there are a lot of rich people who aren't. We're already in the future, and that will become more visible and more anxiety-producing. So uh, if you want to learn more from Eric Davis, there's a link to his substack here. Burning Shore is a uh, title of his substack. And Anya, who is the author of this piece, the contributor to DNR, you can find her work here. I will link the interview with uh, Ruby, friend of the stream. Um, eventually, we'll get to do a podcast together. Uh, Ruby is a contributor to Do Now Research and the author of uh, Checkpoints. Uh, sorry, Cyber Archaeology of Checkpoints. I think I'm messing up the title of his recent book, but uh, we're going to cover that in a future upcoming stream. I'm just getting back into town, so I'm a little bit behind uh, catching up with everybody. So, all right, where are we here? I quite enjoyed that piece. I'm glad um, I'm paying attention to the stuff happening in the community and uh, tried to sync this with some of our, our schedule because I thought it would be relevant to the stuff that's going on in the reading group and so on. Uh, this last bit about basically summarizing these last few paragraphs, class stratification, polarization of resources, creating basically a breakaway class of people um, using transhumanist technologies, all sorts of like essentially eugenics technologies to become superhumans, extend their lifespan, have infinite resources like Brian Johnson. That sounds very plausible to me. And I think I wrote about it in the book. I said it's something like the transhumanist preoccupation with human difference. They mentioned it before, this like the new right, dark enlightenment, all of that shit that's like preoccupation with like dumb shit like IQ, you know, like the IQ bullshit that keeps going around so much in the last few years. Like that is that is so tiny and insignificant and unimportant compared to the massive explosion of intelligence that's going to be AI. It just doesn't make sense why transhumanists would fixate so much on questions surrounding IQ if they really believe that there's going to be a singularity, you know, the combined intelligence of everyone on the planet in this one AI. Why are they so fixated on this thing? It's because their ideology is to make class an empirical reality, not something that is the product of an economy. They want it to be like ingrained in the genetic level that there is a immutable hierarchy uh, in, in society. That's like the, the ideological component of it. And so they fixate on these little things as like, you know, the place where they're going to draw the wedge and then ultimately break away, leave the rest of us behind, eating probably the gruel that <laughs> Brian Johnson, this is the great irony in that in the transhumanist utopia, um, both the ultra wealthy and the peasants are all going to be eating this gruel slop soylent bullshit it really it literally looks like dog shit that's like what the hell is he eating here it looks so bad it looks so bad all right let's <laughs> i got i got distracted a little bit on that last one let's see where we are in the schedule uh we're gonna look into loosh finally we're looking into loosh how are we doing for time we're at nine okay i think we can make everything and I'm going to push that other segment towards next week about uh, I was going to catch up on some news with breaking points and what have you. So instead, we are powering forward to some staggering citizen journalism here. Can I just read the description of this piece? What is the full mobility description of this video? The YouTube video is just like, it's so boomered out. It's almost like impossible. Okay, <laughs> here is the, here is the quote. Here is the quote. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll share this with everybody. This, uh, the author of this video is One Lone Voice. In the book, Far Journeys, Bob Monroe, who is the founder of the Monroe Institute, the originator of the Gateway Tapes, 
Bob Monroe describes something he calls louche. What's louche? Something so valuable that off-world engineers, aka the Demiurge, designed the earth to harvest it. Someone somewhere, or both in millions or uncountable requires, likes, needs, values, collects, uh, drinks, eats, or uses a drug substance identified as louche. Electricity, oil, oxygen, gold, wheat, water, land, old coins, and uranium. This is a rare substance in somewhere, and those who possess louche find it vital for whatever it is used for. How long? Holy shit. How long is this? This is a long... Okay. I did not realize... I knew this was a crazy person, but I didn't realize that they were this crazy. <laughs> Faced with the question of a supply and demand, a universal law of somewhere, someone decided to produce it artificially, so to speak, rather than to search for it in its natural form. He decided to build a garden and grow louche. In its natural state, louche was found to originate from a series of vibrational actions in the carbon, oxygen, something, and residue was louche in varying states of purity. I'm already, I'm already lost. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm already lost. Um, the title of this video is A Quest for Louche, Why the Demiurge Designed the Earth. I'm going to talk about this on a podcast with a friend of the stream, JC Denton. Eventually, let's try and get an education about what the hell this thing is. Uh, forgive me as I mess with the sound as this starts, but the video production, not so professional as you might imagine here. I'm going to turn the volume back on here. And obligations. Oops, sorry, sorry. Here we go. This is not a personal crusade. This is business. And you need to know your rights and obligations while on the Earth adventure. So here we go. In the book Far Journeys, Bob Monroe describes something he calls louche. Louche is something so valuable that off-world engineers designed the earth to harvest it. Quote, someone, somewhere, or both, in millions or uncountable, requires, likes, needs, values, collects, drinks, eats, or uses as a drug, a substance, ident, louche. Electricity, oil oxygen gold wheat water land old coins uranium this is a rare substance in somewhere and those who possess loose find it vital for whatever it is they use it for faced with the question of supply and demand a universal law of somewhere someone decided to produce it artificially so to speak rather than search for it in its natural form he decided to build a garden and grow louche. In its natural state, louche was found to originate from a series of vibrational actions in the carbon-oxygen cycle, and the residue was louche in various states of purity. It occurs only during such action and secondarily during the reactive process. Prospectors from somewhere range far and wide in search of loose sources, and new discoveries were held with much enthusiasm and great reward. And so it was, until someone and his garden changed all of this. End of quote. Bob Monroe just gave you the back office version of the book of Genesis. He gave you the why of Genesis. Oh boy. <laughs> this place, our earth. What are we doing here? Everything in it was designed to grow something called louche. But what's louche? Louche is emotional energy, the energy from emotion. Emotion is a natural, uh, instinctive state of mind deriving from one's circumstances, mood, or your relationships with other people. Your state of mind is then transmitted in all directions, including inward, inside of you. In the case of harvesting just Gwyneth emote louche, the someone discovered, well, first off, he discovered that the best emote 
Lush producers were the experimental beings ident human. It was also discovered that Emote Lush was released in massive amounts at the moment of death. And while in conflict or protecting its offspring, its children. It was also discovered that a human protecting its child not only makes louche, but a more purified version of it. You see, up until that time, all louche required distilling to get to a usable level of refinement. But okay, we're we're about um, halfway through this uh, this masterpiece of a dissertation on whatever the hell louche is, but. Um, I just I have a few questions for the for the chat. So Lush is human emotion. <laughs> Lush is human emotion. Uh, it comes from love. It comes from uh, when you die also. Um, and Lush is very valuable to some being in the universe. How? How did he discover this thing? Like, who told it to him? Did he found did he find it written down somewhere? How do you measure Lush? Just like it just very generally, like, was it revealed to him in a dream? <laughs> you know, like, what is the source of the information here? That's um, that's my first question. Um, does everybody have the same amount of Lush? I read all about Lush in the book Holes. I don't think I read that. I think my brother read that, but I was a little too old. I think I missed it growing up. Lush in the book Holes? I'm not sure. Breakthrough while meditating, right? Yeah, that's kind of that's what I'm getting at. Is like, I think this is the kind of meme where it was like, uh, uh, you know, the guy's asking source, and he says it was revealed to me in a dream. Like, I get my news from cryptic revelations in my dreams. It's the only news that I trust. Is it? Oh, it's muted now. Sorry. It's hold attention. On. And when Bring someone got a usable level of refinement, but not here, and yeah, as you may have guessed okay. already that got someone's attention. And when someone got back to the scene on Earth, the situation got even more interesting. Because even though a human protecting his young as babies produced high-grade emote louche, it, it wasn't enough to account for all the high-grade louche they were, you know, they were getting. It, it's like, what? how can I put this? Imagine you got a raise at your job, all right? You got a raise at work, but <laughs> when you got paid, there was more money than what you were expecting. It was twice as much. And neither your employer nor your bank knows where the hell the money came from. So someone decided to go out and have a look for it itself. And as someone hovered what? over its garden, <laughs> someone finally realized where the high grade emote louche was coming from. As it turns out, the humans who were emitting all this refined loose were lonely. They were lonely. And huh. then when the humans saw the someone hovering over them, the humans then fell on their faces, started crying in awe and reverence, which produced even more highly refined emo loose. So humans are the most efficient. Wait, let me read this quote. Let me read this quote, sorry. I'm trying to grasp this concept. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Humans make the best loosh is what they're saying here. Mute it again, God damn it. So humans are the most efficient emote loose producers. Death makes emote loose. Conflict makes emote loose. Fear for your children makes high grade emote loose. Unfulfillment and loneliness makes more high grade emote loose. And fear of God also makes high grade emote loose. Now, can you guess what happened after all this new information was processed and put to use? You should. If you do a bunch of research chemicals, you either become this kind of guy or the stabby kind of guy. Yeah. Yeah. But we're going to end this Castle video Batman. by giving you uh, the point of view, the overview from the engineer's point of view. High grade distilled 
emote loose is generated in humans by the act of unfulfillment. The <laughs> unfulfillment both, must get a vibrate member. <laughs> at a rate God. higher than the noise of daily life or no loose will form. And the opposite holds true as well. So the more intense the unfulfillment, the more high grade loose. Whoa. To further this end, okay. humans were first split into halves, male and female. This created loneliness as they tried to reunite again. Second, humans were encouraged to breed and live by rules of dominance. Fast forward to the current time. Someone and their team have evolved an entire software suite. And the more software? common tools that the software uses are named love, friendship, family, greed, hate, pain, Boy. guilt, disease, pride, ambition, ownership, possession, sacrifice. And on a larger scale, you have nations, all isms, wars, famine, religion, machines, freedom, industry, and trade, just to name a few. But as things stand today, the Earth Garden is a fascinating model of cosmic efficiency. Question, if it's all a trap, how do you get out of it? Wait, he's just gonna leave us on that? If it's all a trap, how do you get out of it? If it's, what? Serious question, how high was the guy who wrote this? Well, the passage that I was reading before this is uh, 1,500 views, a relatively small video. The passage that I was reading before, why this is interesting, is because the crazy stuff that it opens with, that, uh, you know, this whole thing of, like, uh, producing louche artificially, creating a garden to grow it and whatever, that's from the Bob Monroe book, the Robert Monroe book. What is the title of it? Can we pull that up on the screen here? Far Journeys. So the guy who invented the gateway process, you know, he, over time, I'm paraphrasing some of this from J.C. Denton, but over time, his belief system became this, right? Like, this is what was revealed to him through meditation, that this entire system existed, that the Demiurge had created Earth to cultivate Lush, to then, you know, suck that from humanity, Maybe he enjoys it. He uses it for something. Yeah, this is the Gateway Tapes guy. Yeah, yeah. This is. I'm not just interested. Oh, here's a crazy lunatic on YouTube. This is why it's so interesting because, like, <laughs> the guy who invented the Gateway Tapes believes this. The crazy guy on YouTube is just doing a kooky way of explaining what the Gateway Tapes guy actually believes. So I think I kind of understand the premise here, which is I'm going to try and summarize it. That's a good way to see if like if you can really understand somebody's belief system is if you can summarize their views to their satisfaction where they, they hear what you say and they're like, ah, yes, this accurately represents what I believe. Uh, obviously, Bob Monroe is not here to do that, but I'll, I'll do my best uh, attempt to try and understand it. So, um, Lush is a product of human emotions. It's like a spiritual energy and it is emitted uh, most effectively and most distilled, most pure. Um, oh shit, Carmelo is saying, planning a counter loose extraction program to reappropriate loose from the Archons is a binaural podcast. <laughs> That's, okay. Yeah, yeah, we're going to have to explore some of that in this uh, uh, upcoming uh, episode. So the loose uh, is extracted by the Demiurge or the Archons or whoever, um, and they get it from love and different emotions, but like most acutely from misery. And so... Cosmic powers that control the universe, more powerful than humans, have created the earth as a garden to farm and produce louche, and then uh, manipulate society in some type of way to make people the most miserable, because that's what extracts the most louche. Louche is analogous to a spiritual energetic adrenochrome. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It sounds totally Totally like that. Yeah, it's like spiritual adrenochrome. That's a great way to understand it. And so uh, Bob Monroe, let's just get a date on Far Journeys, Bob Monroe. Get the uh, publication date on this. 1985. 
1985. And what what is the um, gateway tapes? What is the declassified document? That was from, shit, I'm not sure I remember the, the date, pulling it up here just uh, immediately. Analysis and assessment of the gateway tapes, 1983. Wow, so this is actually really close together. That's wild, that's wild. Okay, so he had this belief, this conception of the universe concurrently with the government research exploring the utility of the gateway tapes. That is really, misery farming sounds like Twitter discourse. Yeah, yeah, actually the demiurge created Twitter to create as much misery as possible to farm louche. That's, uh, that's brilliant, yeah. Wow. All right. I was kind of under the impression that uh, over many, many years of this stuff that Bob Monroe went kind of insane. But I guess, you know, he published that in 1983. He must have been writing it before. Basically, concurrently with the government research into the Gateway Tapes, Bob Monroe is coming up with this Demiurge louche theory. So, wow. Very, uh, very interesting. I'm glad we did that. I've been I've had that link uh, handy for a while and I've been trying to get to it. Um, hadn't found time in the stream until tonight. Kind of dark, actually. This is actually, I, I gotta say, um, this is probably like the most morbid, like dark, darkest belief system that you can imagine, you know? Like spiritual adrenochrome, spiritual deep state, like the demiurge is basically the deep state of God. Pretty dark stuff. Journeys out of the body. Okay. Okay. Well, that's uh, enough spiritual uh, mumbo jumbo and woo woo stuff for tonight for our uh, video lecture documentary part of the stream. We're going to watch something that was linked in the Discord. Apologies. I don't have uh, the user who, who first shared this. It might have been Jerry. It might have been somebody else. But um, it looks super interesting, and I previewed a few minutes of it, but I wanted to share a live reaction as we watch it all together. This is a video from Al Jazeera titled why Evangelicals Influence U.S. Foreign Policy in the Middle East. And this is episode one of, I imagine, a much larger uh, series that is forthcoming. This was released only six days ago. I'll read the description here. The first episode of Praying for Armageddon, that's the name of the series, goes inside the evangelical Christian movement to explore its influence on U.S. democracy and foreign policy. Preparing for the end times, a grassroots pastor gathers an army of veterans in the heartland of the United States, and megachurch ministers provide spiritual advice to politicians in the, in the nation's capital. They call for the final battle, which they believe will trigger the second coming of Christ, central to their apocalyptic prophecy is Israel. Uh, it is with their blessing that the Trump administration controversially recognizes Jerusalem, Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and moves the U.S. embassy there in 2018. It feels like everyone has a say about the destiny of the future of Jerusalem, except for the Palestinians living in it, says Palestinian activist Farouz Sharkawi. Char Not sure I'm saying that correctly. Uh, they'll do a great job of explaining the rest of this. Li Fang, journalist for The Intercept, uh, plays an important role in the documentary. I uh, really enjoyed watching this. I've seen about maybe the first 10 minutes just to see if it was suitable for the stream. Uh, I'll give some commentary, but maybe I'll largely speak over this piece rather than um, uh, rather than pausing it and giving commentary so we stay on schedule for tonight. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father. May, the blood of Christ may the blood of Christ cleanse me. We bless your name. We praise you. We thank you. I do pray that you would wake up your church to fight. Jesus Christ, he is our all in all, he is Lord. The next event on God's prophetic timetable, the rapture of the church. I will be your servant. And from this day forward, and from this day you become my Lord. You become my Lord. In Jesus' name, Jesus. I am saved.
I'm going to talk about war. How many of y'all recognize the Bible is full of war? Amen. And so I don't want you to think that I am raising a militia. Well, I, I've been accused of that, brother, uh, because I get pretty dogmatic about Jesus asked us to fight. And what I want you to just begin to wrap your head around is that Jesus called us to be warriors. Uh, he said, I didn't come to bring peace. He said, I didn't come to bring peace. I come to bring war. How many of you all remember the scripture in Luke, the sixth chapter, where it said, if somebody does evil to you, turn the other cheek. But see, there is another scripture that we forget to die to all of that, and that's Luke 22. Jesus, he said, times are changing. And he said, do you have a sword? Well, Master, we don't have a sword. He said, yeah, if you don't have a sword, go sell your coat and buy one because the time's coming you're going to need a sword. Amen. How many of y'all hear that things may change in this country? Amen. And we're going to have to have a spirit of discernment when to turn the cheek and when to pull a sword. A knight has to be moved by compassion, by love, by something inside of you that hurts. I'm here because I believe that there's got to be men that's raised up. There's got to be men that take on another level. And I'll knight you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit until you to rise and accept your sword of responsibility. Shepherd, we got uh, Christian The church has lost Israel the biker. battle of a Christian nation because Wild they concern themselves guy. with what goes on inside the four walls. The Bible says, a warrior must be funded. An evangelist must be sent. I believe God's raising up another group of people and it's gonna come out of the broken, screwed up people. Lift your, Lift your. speak truth, speak speak truth. truth. right wrong, right wrong, and follow the king. And follow the king. Say, that's my commitment. That's my commitment. That's a night. That's a night. The remnant is always a smaller group that stays loyal. And I, I got, I sorry, I promise I'm not going to speak over this, but like just the tough guy appearance of all of this stuff, and then like being a nationalist for a country you're not from is just such weird politics. That's so bizarre, <laughs> you know, all the tough guy bullshit, and then you spend all of your political energy. Being a nationalist for someone else? Like, what is going on? This is so bizarre. I believe that God is raising up a remnant. It's going to be made up of those men and women that are radical, that are willing to put it all on the line. There's got to be a climax to this war. The, even my wife's support. boyfriend of nationalism. At <laughs> some point, there uh, will be grateful for you too, a major for Armageddon, and I believe that the Happy blood Monday. will Thanks run up to the us. horse's bids. We're moving into a time in our history where we don't know what's going to happen. When is that? That's right now. The next thing that's about to happen is the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything that's necessary for this new world order is at the door. Major uncontrollable fires, the Bible said, will break out all over the world spontaneously. The oh, sun yes, and the moon are. will be darkened. History is moving again. Earthquakes so shattering that the islands of the sea will disappear. The seven seas of the earth will turn to blood. World War.
are so bloody that the blood of those who are killed in battle flows up to 200 miles to the bridle of a horse. Theocracy is back. The coronavirus was Fascism no action. Socialism is back. When you see these signs, for us. when you see nations against nation, when you see the moral collapse of America, when you see these things, the apocalypse is coming. Wow, this is fucking We're epic. called to be warriors. And we need you to get in the fight. We should make a parody organization where we're all nationalists for like just a totally, you know, random, unrelated country. In the tradition of Christianity, there is no single view of the end times. Like a Canadian province or but something. But the American evangelical community has latched on to one. Generally, they believe that believers on earth will be raptured to heaven before things get really bad. And that's the promise to the evangelical that they will not taste death if Jesus comes back and the rapture occurs in their lifetime. Yes. This book is literal from cover to cover. B-I-B-L-E, Basic Information Before Leaving Earth, Bible. The American evangelical Christian is someone who believes every word of the Bible is literally true. Like the apocalypse and the return of Jesus predicted in the book of Revelation, every single sign and wonder that could be interpreted to make it seem like it's sooner, it's all good news to the evangelical Christians. Bring it on. But there are certain verses interpreted in the book of Revelation which seem to intimate that none of this can happen unless the state of Israel exists. There will be no lasting peace in the Middle East until the Prince of Peace, the Lord Jesus Christ, returns. The American evangelical movement now said not only do we recognize this, this process can be advanced by, for instance, torpedoing the peace process so the Palestinians never get their land back. The ancient borders of Israel need to be reclaimed, and then Jesus will come back. When Jerusalem and Israel come together, Yeah, I think um, I think they'll cover this later, but just as a very tiny bit of background, um, Francis Schaeffer was uh, a right-wing religious uh, activist uh, many decades ago, um, very against abortion, um, right-wing conservative Christian politician, uh, sorry, um, lobbyist and activist. And then Frank, who's featured as one of the commentators, is his son who has parted with that worldview. So he knows it from the inside. I, I'm pretty sure they'll cover that uh, later in the doc. As a reporter, I've covered politics for so long and I've seen the fusion of politics and religion in so many ways. In recent decades, evangelical Christian Zionists have become an increasingly powerful force in American politics. I'm now investigating evangelical power and how their direct influence shapes U.S. foreign policy and our relationship to Israel. Some argue that uh, calling for the abolition of Israel and the, the elimination of the only Jewish state isn't anti-Semitic. We are absolutely categorically committed to uh, Israel's right to exist. Well, I'm a reporter from The Intercept. I want to ask you about the hearing. Do you have a quick second? Sure, man. 
Do you think there's a role of uh, religious extremism here in the U.S. funding and shaping the, the conflict? I mean, there are a lot of folks who are part of the evangelical movement that want to support Israel. To support yeah, Israel. Yeah, and, yeah. and we don't really kind of see that that same kind of constituent group pushing the other way. Yeah, I wouldn't label the Baptist or the uh, evangelical community as extreme because I believe, feel like they're following the scripture and what the scripture says about Israel, those who bless Israel will be blessed. I mean, they, they take it literal and I'm one of those people. You know, there are some Christian Zionists that do believe in some of these biblical prophecies and they're very controversial within, even within the Christian sure. Zionist evangelical what the community. Is. Yeah, and believing in Armageddon that there will be a final battle around Jerusalem and that after that battle, you know, um, there's a judgment day, Jews will be killed or converted, Jesus will come back, there's gonna be a rapture event. Um, what do you think about those kind of prophecies? I believe Jesus will come back and I'm, and I'm gonna be on his side. The Christian right has a very organized and concerted effort to shape the messages in DC. I mean, they really have a political apparatus that's very efficient, that's very influential. Shit, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes, uh, I was just echoing uh, Colleen's comment. Damn, he was really like, yup. Um, the one thing I wanted to mention is that as abhorrent as that guy's beliefs are, and as much as I disagree with them, this is democracy. It is a very ugly process in that it is going to result in people expressing their democratic voice, electing all sorts of people who have straight up Looney Tunes ideas, like friend in the sky type of beliefs that there's a big man who's going to rapture everybody and he's got a beard and then he'll bring you up to your sky palace or whatever. You know, I sound like a, <laughs> that sound like a 2005 atheist libertarian shithead. But um, this is part of democracy and uh, responding with, oh, we need to get these guys out of office or whatever. No, you need to have a political alternative that is more appealing to people than the, the sky daddy narrative rapture type of shit. But uh, yeah, those people are going to exist. That is part of, part of democracy and the ugly process of uh, uh, competing for people's hearts and minds in politics. Influential, even if it's often behind the curtain. Ralph Drollinger is a former college basketball star who decided to develop his own Bible studies for politicians. With the advent of secularism in America increasingly on the rise and what we call the mountains of influence that are toppling of late, one of the places we're trying to hang on is the mountain of political leadership to make sure we make disciples in that arena so that they can stand in office with a prophetic voice and say, thus saith the Lord. Ralph Drollinger formed his Bible study, meeting with radical right politicians, and slowly grew it. His Bible study today has over 50 members of Congress in attendance. He brought his Bible study to the White House. He convened weekly Bible studies with the members of the Trump cabinet. So one of the reasons we're issuing this how to think about Israel through the lens of scripture Bible study of recent was because of the the bombing from Gaza, and then the glitch within the administration to not fund the Iron Dome resupply. I thought I better issue a Bible study that helps bring biblical clarity to this issue. In these Bible studies, Drawing Her has attempted to provide moral and biblical justification for some of the most extreme radical right policies. He's used the Bible to justify the coronavirus, blaming gays and members of the LGBT community, and really engage in the type of radical right rhetoric that you might hear on kind of dark corners of the internet. But here's someone who's directly pastoring the Secretary of State under the Trump administration and members of Congress. Oh God, our Father, thou searcher of men's hearts, help us to draw near to thee in sincerity and truth. May our religion be filled with gladness and may our worship of thee be natural. 
Yeah, it's amazing the access they got. When you look the at the book of in the Revelation, things are going to get worse before they get better. And we're going to end up in a tribulation period where the Antichrist is going to war against Israel and Christ is going to come back to save Israel from the Antichrist. Here's a public policy issue where the U.S. interests are at play, where there are so many different policy solutions that can be considered, but religion is playing the dominant role. Uh, we're, we're talking to uh, members of Congress about Israel and the U.S.'s relationship. All right, y'all go. The U.S. has an intrinsic interest in making sure that Israel not only receives our best prayers and offers of success, but our armaments, our money, and our ability to make sure that in a very dangerous reason, this democracy survives. There are some uh, biblical prophecies that say that control of, of Jerusalem by the Jews uh, is important for the second coming of, of Christ. This entire matter is based upon faith of our maker, of our creator, but it's also faith of a chosen people. Can you ask why the Democrats um, keep using our law enforcement officers and political funds? The Democrats who have been campaigning to defund our law enforcement as their people, BLM and Antifa, riot and loot in the streets. How would you, you like to see the Capitol Police on there? new government in Israel. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of the U.S. relationship with Israel? There have been two nations created to glorify God, Israel and the United States of America. I will bless both. I will honor both. I will do all I can to stand and defend them. Thank you, Congresswoman. Take care. Is it true that there are people who really believe that Put having Jerusalem lady? unified what? under total Israeli control will bring on the end times? Wait, expand on that. Well, yes, Joy. Is there you a story know, I, come I don't from know a about? Fundamentalist evangelical background, and I grew up in the 50s and 60s. I'm 65, and when I was a so my background is one where biblical prophecy Wait, about the end times of Jesus's return, the apocalypse, were the reality we lived with. And I can remember as a child flushing a toilet and looking to see if the water had turned to blood yet, because this was a sign that the apocalypse was about to occur. Abortion on demand is another humanistic euphemism for man playing God. Its ramifications go beyond that. I'm the son of a fundamentalist American missionary People would show up to sit at the feet of Francis Schaeffer and learn the spirituality from him. I was a prince of evangelical royalty. By the time I was 18 years old, I was talking to crowds of 20,000 people. But over a 15, 20 year period, gradually, like a drug addict, I came clean. I'm still estranged from huge chunks of my family because I'm a heretic. I've joined the other side. The bedrock of support for the state of Israel is there because American evangelicals think it will bring Jesus back quicker. And without the Republican bedrock evangelical voter, no Republican anywhere in America for any office gets elected. You commit yourself to the principles of God, and politicians align themselves with the eternal values in this book. Thank you very much. I want you to know that I endorse you and what you are doing. I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. If the evangelical movement had not morphed into the religious right, you would not have a situation that would put Donald Trump in power. Stay by. We who are evangelical Christians are going to have a true friend in the White House.
The big numbers who were there on January 6th protesting him not getting elected were evangelicals. For them, when Trump lost the election, somehow this couldn't be right because they had interpreted him being president for another four years as God's will. Today, the modern evangelical is preparing for an actual holy war, armed, training, militia groups, plenty of guns, plenty of ammunition. They're gonna cost what you might call sane, ordinary America very heavily. How are you this morning? God bless y'all. When Jesus comes back, he's not going to send an army. He's going to lead an army. I want to be in that. And I want to be right up in the front. Jesus said, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. So if you really want to be at the front with Jesus, you got to quit trying to fight to be successful. You got to fight to be at the lower end. Host, Merry Christmas. Uh, that's fine. We understand. We've all had those days. <laughs> hey, girls, you know what? We ride motorcycles. So you think these guys get funding horse, from right? Israel? <laughs> we ride iron horses. You're going to ride a stick horse. Yeah. All right? Hey, we're uh, in the port in uh, Ashdod, Israel. And we just opened the containers, and the bikes are good. They made the... In 2011, I oh, shipped here we go. motorcycles <laughs> to Israel. It took 74 people over there. When we rolled into Jerusalem, we had our 30 bikes, and then we had 120 Israeli bikes. This ride was to honor the IDF soldiers. And we would just say, we just want you to know that we care about Israel, and we thank you for your sacrifice for this country. Well, wow, I don't <laughs> What a strange How thing. When I say Megiddo Valley, you know what that means. How many of you know what the Battle of Armageddon is? Memorial Day the for Final a different war of country. Good and evil? That's where it's gonna be fought. And I'm on this Harley, <laughs> and I'm headed in the Megiddo Valley I'm coming the direction that the enemy, the devil, and all of his forces are going to come against the bride riding on that big white horse. Visually, God, I can see that big white horse. And I'm riding along there, and I says, God, I don't want to be at the back of the pack. I want to be right up there as close to you as you, I can. I want, I want to see Jesus take that sword and slay the enemy and watch the blood run up to the bits of the horses. Anybody else in here? Man, I'm riding on that motorcycle getting pumped. And I said, God, let me, I will be right up there close to the front. I want to see it. What do I got to do to get there?
a certain price. If I say Zionist, you pay me a certain price. If I say Zionist, Israel, and Jewish, that's the big three, I get paid for that. Right, same as always. Yeah, just keep paying me the same thing. Zionist, Israel, Jewish, you pay me. No problem. If I do a water, but what, what if I do a watermelon emoji and if I say something about fuck Palestine? If I say fuck Palestine on camera, okay, you're gonna give me more. Okay, cool. Don't fucking film me. Nice for the I think it's staged. I think it's a long up. I don't think it's a real video. Hi, good morning. I think he's gonna come back in two weeks and be Welcome like, to our Jerusalem tour. You thought I would do this because I'm getting paid? I'm doing it, it because like I really believe it. It has a say about the destiny and the future of Jerusalem, except for the Palestinians living in it. So the eastern part of occupied Jerusalem is on the left. He the western part of occupied Jerusalem is on the right hand right now. The green line is the internationally recognized border between east and west of Jerusalem and between Palestine and Israel. For us Palestinians, Jerusalem is not just an important city. Jerusalem is the symbol of Palestine. Since the occupation of the eastern part of Jerusalem in 1967, the Israeli occupation authorities have been designing and implementing policies of systematic displacement against Palestinians. The western part of Jerusalem, ethnically cleansed during the 1948 war. The rest of the map is the eastern part of Jerusalem that was occupied in 1967 and not entirely ethnically cleansed. The wall on this map is the black line. The wall is built deep inside the West Bank. It is not on the Green Line. So the wall is not just security, it is also taking over lands. Check out the huge amount of land that the wall de facto annexed to the Israeli control. Damn, this is like reverse birthright here. Taking people on a tour of the occupation. Our land is confiscated systematically. Our homes are demolished systematically as well. We see very clearly the strategic cooperation between the Israeli occupation authorities on the one hand and settler organizations on the other hand. This is settler colonialism in its most classic way. Residents in East Jerusalem's Silwan neighborhood said that Jewish settlers had moved into two buildings in the predominantly Arab area. It's coveted by Israeli settlers who refer to it as the city of David. It makes me very angry to know that the funding that these settler organizations receive from people, especially in the United States, is making it possible for them to actively push Palestinians out from their city. That is south and beneath, under the old city, is Silwan. More than 70 Palestinian homes in Silwan are now colonial outposts with colonial settler families living in them. In Silwan, there is a so-called national park Insane. called the City of David, claimed to be where King David's palace was 2,000 years ago. The City of David is managed and controlled by the notorious El Ad Settler Organization, which is in charge of the settlement activities in Silwan. The same settler organization now 
want to establish a biblical theme park in Silwan. A uh, theme park? Using Jewish history in order to justify the uprooting of Palestinians. For decades, Palestinian families that have lived in Jerusalem for generations upon generations are then forced out of their homes and squashed into refugee camps. This is happening in Sheikh Jarrah, my neighborhood. This is happening in Silwan through various organizations that ultimately have the same goal of replacing Palestinian natives with Jewish settlers. For years, it was settlers that would change every now and then. They were in their early 20s, and I believe they were being paid, and they are just there to harass us. Carmelo has actually, this is, um, this is a good, I think of these as like ideological wedges to put into people's thinking about these issues, right? The Castle Doctrine, if you're not familiar, uh, the Castle Doctrine is your legal right to defend your own home with the use of force. Uh, you know, your home is your castle, right? Literally, uh, if the uh, uh, an invader comes into your home, you can defend yourself with uh, force. If the king comes into your home, you can equally defend yourself with force. Uh, nobody can lay claim to your own territory. This is something that libertarians and conservatives believe fully, a thousand percent. Um, and that's very popular on the American right, many of which are also evangelicals and Zionists themselves. So how would they resolve this type of issue where, you know, this real tough guy behavior of pushing an old woman out of her generational family's home? Um, would they allow her to use the casual doctrine to defend herself? That's actually a pretty good, yeah, because they believe in both and you present them with the question and then they have to choose one. They have to choose one belief system or the other. You can't, uh, you can't have both in this situation. So that's a great insight there, Carmelo. That's, uh, it's a seriously simple talking point I brought up with Zionist sympathizers. Frame things in of terms of, in, of frame things, excuse me, frame things in terms of individualist liberties couched in familiar Western language. That's uh, that's a great technique. These settler organizations operate as charities in the United States. They are tax exempt. And the evangelical organizations just funneling money into them. In Sheikh Jarrah, we have what the Israeli Foreign Ministry refers to as a property dispute, in which billionaire backed settler organizations can come from all over the world and exploit a judiciary that is built by settlers to enforce their claims over our lands. Jacob, you know this is not your house. Yes, but if I go, you don't go back. So what's the problem? Why are you yelling at me? I didn't do this. I didn't do this. Yeah. But, but you're, you're It's you're... easy to yell at me, but I didn't do this. Yeah, you are helping. stealing my house. And if I don't steal it, someone else is going to steal it. No, no, no one, no one uh, 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 is allowed to steal it, Yammi.
Ladies and gentlemen, will you please stand and give a warm welcome to a consistent and faithful friend, the 45th Vice President of the United States, Mike Pence. Well, hello, Christians united for Israel. John Hagee is the leading voice of Christian Zionism. He has built a political powerhouse out of his organization, Christians United for Israel. You know, a lot of people get spun up with the wrong ideas that American evangelicals want to impose a theocracy on America. <laughs> I, I wish they'd be concerned about the real theocratic takeover that has been happening in Iran for the last four decades. Christians United for Israel has a really extreme view in terms of promoting geopolitical factors that could lead to what they believe is the Battle of Armageddon. But in terms of the practical effect, they're promoting policies that arm Israel to the teeth with US weapons, that drive Palestinians out of Jerusalem, and that ultimately is pushing towards more conflict in the Middle East. Now, would you give a thunderous welcome to the greatest rock star in Israel? Welcome to the City of David, the place where Jerusalem began. Pastor Hagee, thank you for that very warm introduction. It is an honor, as always, to be here together. If you look at the website for the City of David project, it looks like an effort simply to engage in archaeology to find these biblical artifacts. But underneath the surface, there's a lot of Christian right money and resources and support for this foundation that's leading the effort to evict Palestinian families. The City of David seems like the perfect cover for Christians United for Israel that conceals a very right-wing agenda that's driving this violence. We have 7.1 million members and 5,000 of you in this room, and it's because we're willing to work little by little by little by little. We are going to have a great time on Capitol Hill. This is your opportunity to stand up for Israel and the Jewish people in the halls of Congress, and it will be recorded in the courts of heaven, I assure you. Thank you for putting action uh, behind words. Prayers and hard work makes a difference for America, for Israel, and for the entire world. Wow, what a poster. What organization is this? I have determined that it is time to officially recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Oh, here we go. Thanks for joining us, Pastor Hagee. Really appreciate you being with us here on Faith Nation. I was curious about some of your interactions with the president on this. You visited him at times at the White House? We spoke about moving the embassy. 
Let's go, honey. Let's go. I talked to him about the significance of moving the embassy in the Jubilee year. I said, this is the year to move the embassy and make that declaration because it is a biblical timing of absolute precision. Oh, it's just because of the year. Thank you God know. he's going to do exactly Next year, that. we could forget about it. It doesn't matter. It's just, we're really only will interested be because of the significance as the United of the States year. joins all. Israel to mark the official opening of the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem. What an insane salesman. Pastor Robert Jeffers is delivering the prayer to kick off today's ceremony. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love her prosper. I'd like to call upon Pastor John Hagee. We thank you, O oh Lord, for President Donald Trump's courage in acknowledging to the world a truth established 3,000 years ago that Jerusalem is and always shall be the eternal capital of the Jewish people. Can we all shout hallelujah? As a rabbi, as an Israeli, as a Jew, I believe that the kinds of policies that the Christian fundamentalists, Christian Zionists are advocating for endanger me, my family, my society. This, this guy is going to get himself killed. Oh my God. They increase the chance that we will continue to live here by the sword in perpetual warfare. Okay, Okay. I've been on many occasions beaten up by Israeli security forces. I've been attacked by settlers. The masked Israeli settler armed with a knife attacking the co-founder of the group Rabbis for Human Rights, Rabbi Arik Asherman. I'm willing to face those things because I do believe the only way there's ever going to be peace is by restoring hope. 
that what happens here affects the entire world. بدهم فلسطين بدون سكان وامريكا دعميتهم وترامب بعطيهم القدس هو القدس لابو القدس لابو ترامب ارض الناس اللي هناك اقول والله هذه اعطيها لواحد ثاني ما بصير ما مش ملك الكاف تعطيه <تصفيق> It is inconceivable to me that God would want us to be treating other human beings this way. And it is impossible, from what I do know of Jesus, that he would be in favor of oppressing other people. At this time, we're going to honor the Judeo-Christian values by playing the Jewish prayer. I take back all of the disparaging things I have ever said about weird Maoist cults that believe in like satellites and vast conspiracies and all sorts of UFO nonsense, all of that is less weird than this. This is one of the weirdest things I have ever seen. My goodness. This is extreme cult behavior. This is very weird. I've ridden hundreds of thousands of miles 
And God has spoken so many things to me in that solitude. And that's my sanctuary. It's a place for me to hear God. Damn, gang, I gotta say, this was like, I had pretty good expectations for this one. I think this was excellent. Um, this was only put out, what was it? Uh, six days ago, I thought. I can't, I can't find the date that it was uploaded here. Uh, sorry, March 19th, so a little more than, uh, what? No, six days ago. Yeah. Wow. Um, I would totally be down to watch some other episodes on forthcoming streams. Let's, what's this link in the chat from? Hold on, let me open this in another tab. Colleen sent us a link in the chat. Liberal Elmo <laughs> animated. Okay. This, I appreciate. <laughs> Liberal Elmo, uh, an animated come down clip. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sending this. But I think, I think we'll wind down the stream for tonight. Um, it's, uh, people really, people really want to watch it. All right, okay. We're gonna do five minutes and then we'll wrap up. Are you going, Gordon? Well, I've been priced out of Sesame Street, Elmo. <laughs> <laughs> the taxes got too high and had to sell the brownstone that's been in my family for a hundred years. I'm gonna grab. And the... now I'm homeless. I, I mean, had it's to an asset. I had to use the money to move my mother into a nursing home, <laughs> oh, man. and they abused her. Get episode two. Oh, Do you get a settlement or something? No, not at all. I got arrested for getting too loud on the phone with the insurance company. <laughs> <laughs> but now yeah. you get to live here, Elmo. That's awesome. That's great, Gordon. <laughs> Good Thanks, fuck you, Gordon. Right Gordon, did you see what conservatives are saying about AOC? <laughs> Sorry, Elmo. I'm completely checked out. <laughs> this is great. I need some space for my podcast studio. <laughs> <laughs> it all worked out in the end. I'll see you later, Gordon. <laughs> I'm going to Maria Hernandez Park to skateboard until I can give a 19-year-old HPV. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> God damn it. I'm going to be a photographer <laughs> for Vice, Gordon. <laughs> I'm 47 years old. <laughs> Good luck. Good luck moving to Rockland County or oh, something. <laughs> Uh, I guess you're either going to East Brooklyn or, yeah. or jail. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe you'll move with your family back to Gordon, I totally get it. I went to all the protests last summer, you know. <laughs> I'm on your side. <laughs> we really made a difference, Gordon, for those three days. I mean, it's really not that simple, Elmo. You know what? I'm kind of tired of talking about this. Can't we just all move on? Let's just fucking move on, please. We believe in science. The important thing was is making sure the vaccines got <laughs> rolled out. And last time I checked, it wasn't red fuzzy people not getting the vaccine. <laughs> <laughs> all the red fuzzy people I know, they took they the took vaccine. They took it at the earliest opportunity. It's maybe a different group of people who... Naturally, obviously, have a reason to be oh suspicious of <laughs> Oh, my God. But I get that. The orange man is gone. <laughs> we have a ghost now. Elmo murdered his newly purchased brownstone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Gordon would go out like a fucking hero for that Just one. Just because mm -hmm. I went defund the police doesn't mean I can't call them on you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> if I <laughs> if I hear bachata music played too loud, mm. too late into the night, I can still call the police. I have to work for two I hours. Called a, I called, but I requested a social worker. <laughs> I told him I thought you were mentally ill <laughs> for letting your dog bark after 7 p.m. <laughs> I said I don't want it to turn in to a to a Tamia Rice situation. I'm no sorry your children were sent to juvie, but they shouldn't have opened that fire hydrant on a Gordon, hot day. did you steal my fucking bicycle? <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna get abs from life. Well, I I'm gonna ring doorbell and I'm gonna watch the video. <laughs> yeah. Gordon, I'm sorry for accusing you of stealing my bike. It's just I just got out of a toxic relationship, <laughs> and I'm still processing the trauma. 
So you have to understand. She's got borderline personality disorder. You have to understand <laughs> that I have, I've, I have my own issues. <laughs> And uh, maybe we can split your lawyer fees, seventy five twenty. I'll pay twenty five percent, which of course is due back to me. Whenever you, when honestly, no rush. It's six percent interest annually. <laughs> I swear, no rush at all. <laughs> Do you have a business license for this lemonade stand? <laughs> Gordon, Can I see a yeah. permit, Gordon? Gordon, I, that's very cute that your granddaughter's trying to start a business, but the thing is, is it bothers me. There's a there's a process <laughs> that you have to honestly go through with the city before she can make money for her basketball honestly, team. Your tone and the way you're asking me, why are you doing this, is. It's frightening me. <laughs> and you're leaving me very little option but other than to call the police, which I don't want to do. I don't I want to defund. Do Ideologically speaking, because I'm a good fucking person, I don't want to do it. <laughs> but push comes to shove. <laughs> I will and I have. I already did. <laughs> <laughs> I've requested that they only bring tasers and a social worker. <laughs> no, but if they don't, don't, it's already out of my hand. <laughs> <laughs> I'll film it in case you need it as evidence. I'll as film it just in case. Good God. <laughs> all right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us tonight. Where? What's playing here? Okay, we're all set. Um, this was a super fun stream. Uh, lots of stuff coming up for next month. The game is coming out. Um, podcast, Substack, uh, uh, tons of things in the pipeline. So thanks everybody for watching. This was a super fun stream, and I will see you next week. Have a good night, everybody.